Good evening and welcome to our Monday Thursday service. I'm here, as you can see, and I also have my sidekick, Mike, socially distant from me over there. Good evening, how are you folks? Uh, this is actually March 31st we're recording this. We're putting them all in the can, as we say in the business here, so that we have them ready for the next three services provided. Watch carefully, the coats change. Karen? So I welcome you again to our Monday Thursday service. Tonight we're going to remember Jesus last night with his disciples as they gathered in an upper room for a final meal together. And the service tonight will be revisiting a very moving presentation of the fabric of Jesus' life from a few years ago. And one of the things we'll be hearing about was this night with the disciples when Jesus instituted the Last Supper and he washed the feet of his disciples. But for now, let's prepare our hearts for this special service with a time of silent centering prayer. Ask God to bless us in this time together that we might feel our bond of togetherness even while we're apart from each other. Let us pray.
Let's call our worship to order. You have this program printed in your bulletin. This is a night to remember. We remember the Passover Jesus shared with his disciples. We remember his new covenant of broken bread and cup. We remember his night alone in the garden in prayer. We remember this night and thank God for Jesus' presence with us then and with us now. Would you please pray with me now the prayer that you find in your printed bulletin ever gracious God we gather this evening hour as friends gathered with Jesus in an upper room long ago we come bearing the marks of a bitter and broken world we come from anonymous places with dry and thirsty spirits remind us in the breaking of the bread of our need of your sufficiency Refresh us and make us whole with the cup of forgiveness. Draw us nearer to each other in mutual service and closer to you in the covenant of faithfulness and thanksgiving. As the night advances, deepen in us a sense of your steadfast love for us in Jesus Christ, our friend and our redeemer. Amen. Now hear me while I pray. 
its grace impart strength to my fainting heart, my zeal inspire. As thou hast died for me, oh, may my love to thee, pure, warm, and changeless be a living fire. While life's dark maze I tread, and griefs around me spread, be thou my guide. Bid darkness turn to day, wipe sorrow's tears away, nor let me ever stray from thee aside. When ends life's transient dream, when death's cold sullen stream shall o'er me roll, bless Savior then in love, fear and distrust remove, me safe above a ransom soul. The first reading is Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. It certainly wasn't a grand beginning. And you know, it seemed like it should have been. Before the birth, there were angels everywhere, announcing the pregnancy to Mary, appearing in Joseph's dreams, singing in the night skies above the shepherds. Wealthy magi from the east traveled long, long distances to bring gifts and pay tribute. But this child Jesus was born in lowly conditions, laid in a manger, wrapped in bands of cloth, humble beginnings. And Jesus never seemed to forget this. He could have been a great and famous religious leader in the temple. He was brilliant. Already at the age of 12, Jesus amazed the teachers in the temple with his understanding. And he turned out to be a great teacher himself, an amazing storyteller and orator. Throngs of people followed and came to hear him speak. But Jesus consistently turned away from fame always seeking out the poor, the ill, the lame, the lepers. His heart was with the marginalized, and always he drew them in, defended them, demanded something better for them. Jesus' humble birth, the manger, and the swaddling bands of cloth already marked the way he would live with and minister to the people on the edges.
chose tells this story as, as our Lord became an adult and started his ministry. He was about 30 years old. And he went from place to place just teaching and preaching, telling stories and healing. And eating, sharing food, sitting at the table with just about anyone. He walked out to the sea as the, as the crowd gathered around him, he taught them and, and walked along. He saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, a tax collector, and said, follow me. And he sat at his house. Many tax collectors and sinners, they were also sitting there. And there were just many that followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with those rotten tax collectors, he said, how does he do that? Well, the sick have no need of a physician, but I've come to call it not the righteous, but the sinners. Shared meals, the, the family dinner, it, it was the gist of what he did. Everywhere, accepting invitations, eating with anyone. He didn't care about social graces, not a bit. Or the, I'm concerned about political, not, not our Lord. The undesirables and the outcasts. I avoid them. But he sat and ate and just sharing that bread with anyone who cared to come. It, it wasn't about right or wrong, moral criteria, or being set apart. That's not what this was about. It was about welcome and hospitality in a relationship. Unconditional acceptance and love. Accepting each person all their beauty and all their hurt. At Jesus' table, everyone's just welcome with love and forgiveness.
was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in a crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed for, from her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. The woman had been sick for 12 years, 12 long, brutal years of bleeding. And when in desperation she secretly dared to touch Jesus' cloak, she was made well. The bleeding stopped instantly. It was almost too good to believe. Actually, it was too good to believe. She knew she was well, but who else would believe it? Everyone knew of her illness, an illness that made her ritually unclean, untouchable. And who would actually believe that she had been healed? No one. They would just go on avoiding her, shunning her, treating her like dirt. And what's more, she had just touched the robe of Jesus, the great teacher, without permission, and, well, stolen her healing. And in the process, she had made him unclean. She might be physically well, but she knew she would continue to live with shame and now also with the guilt of having contaminated Jesus and stolen her healing. But Jesus stopped. It didn't matter that throngs of people wanted his attention. It didn't matter that he was on the way to heal the daughter of the synagogue ruler. Jesus sought out the woman who had been physically healed and gave her something more. He called her daughter a term of love and endearment. He recommended or commended her faith and told her to go in peace. Her healing had been freely given and she did not need to carry any guilt. And he announced her healing to the crowd so that everyone would know that she was no longer sick, so that she would no longer be shamed by her community. From Jesus, the compassionate healer, flowed wholeness, physical healing, spiritual healing, and social healing. As we touch the hem of this robe, we know that Jesus is a healer of every ill.
reading from John. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Jesus, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter Peter said to him, Lord, do not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. For the people of Jesus' time, foot washing was as regular and ordinary as brushing your teeth. After walking along a hot, dusty road in open sandals, it was necessary, necessary to wash your feet for comfort and for cleanliness especially before sitting down to a meal. If you had guests for dinner, foot washing was an essential part of hospitality. But the host of the meal certainly never washed the guests' feet. A slave or a servant would do that. In fact, it was considered much such a menial and unpleasant task that in a household with a hierarchy of servants and slaves, it would always be the duty of the lowest slave. In a home without any slaves or servants, the host would provide a basin of water and a towel, and the guests would wash their own feet. For Jesus to wash the disciples' feet was a revolutionary social act. He overthrew the social hierarchies of his day and called his disciples to mutuality and love. Jesus, Lord and teacher, was also a humble servant. Jesus, who dared to argue with the Pharisees and scribes, who overturned the tables and cleansed the tape of the temple, also knelt down and washed his disciples' feet. When Jesus took a towel and girded himself, he embodied the strength and humility of a servant leader. We've heard Jesus' words that as we do what he did, as we serve others, people will remember him. They'll know we are his. They'll know his love in very real ways. We do this, we'll so hear I- the words and music of a wonderful hymn, Yesu, Yesu.
So they took Jesus. And carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which is in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. While the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. This was to fulfill what the scriptures had said. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they drew lots. And this is what the soldiers did. <clears throat> so much mockery, so much scorn. They flogged Jesus, then dressed him in a purple robe, and put a crown of thorns on his head. They hailed him king of the Jews, then struck him in the face. They crucified him beneath the sign that read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And while he hung there dying, the soldiers divided his clothes among themselves and gambled for his tunic. Bystanders and passers-by jeered and taunted him. Despite all the mockery and scorn, despite the seeming failure of it all, Jesus staked everything, even his life, on what he might, what he had taught and lived. Identification with the poor and marginalized, a ministry of welcome, love, and healing, the strong, unwavering call for justice, and humble lowing service. This Jesus proclaimed in the very fabric of life, the way of the truth. The only way, no matter what the cost, he gave his life because he refused to live and believe otherwise. And now, my friends, be at peace and know that the peace of God is with you. Amen.